I didn't advocate for my children. And that's who needed a big, strong man in the house, too. So did, so did Olivia, honestly, right? But that was the hardest lesson I could ever have learned, is that a man has to learn to do what is right, even if he loses love as a result yeah. of it. Dude, I was not willing. I was not willing to lose Liv because... I was like, will I ever get into a, the, the nice guy fears, the limiting beliefs of the traditional nice guy. I'll never find anyone hotter, right? I'll lose love forever. I'll be stuck with this, blah, 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 blah. But it's not just your outer children that need to be advocated for. It's your inner child, yeah. you know, needs to be advocated for. And so when a man truly embodies his masculine core, he advocates for the kids on the outside and the kids on the inside. Ah, Richard. Welcome to my podcast. And straight up, I'm just going to throw to you. Introduce yourself. Cool, man. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Richard Earl. Or my mentor likes to call me Earl the Pearl Lonsberry. <laughs> and he called me that. Uh, was I bald when he called me that? I'm not sure. But like, you know, not that the context really matters. But uh, my name is Richard Lonsberry. I'm a masculine leadership mentor for high performing men, essentially, which is the LinkedIn version of saying that I help men essentially man up which is, it took me 33 years to learn what that means and how to do so in a way that is congruent with, you know, higher consciousness, as well as being mindful and being aligned with your authentic self. And um, that is what makes the world a better place, to have a safer place for the people that we love is when a man is actually aligned with his soul, right? And operates out of his heart rather than his mind, rather than like survival, you know? And um, I... Uh, have been a professional failure for <laughs> like 32 years. And it's just this year that I'm actually starting to thrive in every capacity and in all areas ever since I put God and life and love at the epicenter of my life and personal responsibility. And so that's what I love to help men do is really own their shit and create the life that they want that is on their terms because what's best for your highest self is what's best for the people that you love. You know, it's like your cup runneth over. And so uh, we're already getting started, but that's, you know, <laughs> long story long. Um, my name, you know, I'm, I'm a men's coach who loves helping men fall in love with themselves and learn how to love others. Ah, uh, that, that touched me in ways that, that, that I don't want to speak to here. <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful thank you i also I'm noticed, er uh, I'm, my soul is erect <laughs> right now oh <laughs> uh, yeah I'm, so, I'm feeling it all in my body i'm like bro you're speaking my language like this this is so right right now and ripe like in this, this yeah. epoch that we're in right now of, like of men looking for leadership and connecting with themselves and I, being professional failures for most of their lives, myself included, and then um, being able to turn that around, like finding, hitting that pain point and going, oh, look, I, I'm not being this same guy that my dad was or my uncles were or the men that I see around me and I, that I yeah. need help to, to change my trajectory. I also noticed that you're in a car right now. I know for myself, I love being in my car and recording things because the, the acoustics in the car is just so much better. So much better yeah yeah and plus it's the quiet place in my home like if we're keeping if we're keeping it a full stack like i was homeless for two years i was like i can't wait to have a home office and have that stupid microphone that every fucking coach has it's like right there face right with like le neon fucking lights in the background and, and my face and logo and whatever and then we i love our place don't get me wrong god love our place but the the doors are like two inches off the freaking ground, Damn. right? So the acoustic. So like I'll I'll be on a coaching call, and some guys like oh, I never knew my father, right? <laughs> and then the next thing you hear is Daddy, Daddy, who never knew their father, Daddy. That's correct. <laughs> so I was like I I manifested this home. And I was like, I can't wait to work out of it. No, my kids are like, fuck you, man. <laughs> so I'm going to the car because it's the quietest, most acoustic, best sound in my home. 
And it's for me. It's my space. <laughs> it's my safe space. My safe space. You get me, you me. I love it. Like for me, like I'm in my garage right now. There's a brick wall. <laughs> brick wall, you know, if I just put my camera around, I've got like I've got like my hitting gear over here, like still got baby stuff on the floor over here. <laughs> When Cassie, when Cassie goes out, you know, she leave Luca. Luca my, is my son. Luca with me, yeah. and he'll be like playing on the floor, like my rattles or whatever, like other stuff I've got there. Um, mm-hmm. But when he cries, when I'm going through a process with someone and he cries, he tends to trigger somebody else that's on my call. And they're like, where's this baby crying? <laughs> like, yeah, cool, Luca. Keep that shit up, bro. I'll charge it. <laughs> Here's your college fund. Building up your college fund. Like, is my um my welcome partner. <laughs> but yeah, Dude, you gotta send him a. You gotta. You have to write off your son. Like he's a freaking tax. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean, it's like. So I need, I need to take. I need to take this person deeper. Let's turn up some of, some of Luca's Luca's crying and tantruming. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, get in there. Get in that, all that emotional space, all those nooks and crannies. Oh, listen, before before anything, I have a story. I have a beautiful story. I'm not going to share it right now, but remind me to share the the crying grown-ass man story, okay? All right, all right cool. Let's make it a note here. Crying hey, you... grown-ass man story, yeah. Has, has anyone ever told you that you look like like a darker, more handsome, enlightened Eric Bana? <laughs> I have had that. I've been mistaken. Yeah. For Eric. I used to work in the film industry. I've been mistaken for Eric Banner before. Bro, mm. you got that vibe. I, My friends, they say that I look like Vin Diesel if he didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that's brutal. Oh, man. Was that joke so good that I lost you? Uh, maybe. I oh, will come back. We'll be back. It's so It was so potent. Like Vin Diesel felt it. Um, and then sent his and sent his Fast and the Furious. Like, no, nah, that's, that's it. Fast and the Furious twenty four. But no, nah, it's, it's yeah. coming. <clears throat> so, dude, like your life story, like the little bio that you wrote, you wrote to me um, before jumping yeah. on this call. Incredible man, and um, like losing everything. And I think that's a that's a journey that a lot of men go through to to hit that point of like, oh my God, it's like, it's me or whatever it was. Like, so give us some, give us some background into that, that 33 years of, of being a quote unquote failure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. So I guess the, the part of my life that probably will be turned into a screenplay has, would probably be like the last three years. Right. So I was, you know, I was 24 when Olivia and I had our first son, Elliot. And one of my mentors, Christian Simpson from John C. Maxwell camp, because that's where I first got my certification. He said, what we do not fix within ourselves, our children will inherit. Okay. Now I heard that. And if that doesn't light a fire under your ass in terms of personal development and wanting to like, you know, see what's in here, I don't know what will. Right. So I had the intention (laughs) of growing myself. Right. But it took forever. Honestly, it took it's like six years of my son's life for me to even realize, oh, I'm the problem, you know? And uh, I was outsourcing my own sovereignty, my own security, my own sense of self. I was hanging it on the hats of women. As long as you were a beautiful woman who approved of me, I was therefore enough, right? That was a big part of like my mother and father was, you know? It's that worth wound and, and, and this the nice guy trap, right? It's the nice guy trap. It's as long as a hot woman, you know, pats me on the head or has sex with me, I therefore worthy. And one of the, the insidious things is then I'm man enough. And then I can actually belong to the tribe. And then I won't get, you know, excommunicated, right? And that that had run my life. I was like a dog chasing cars, just going from one relationship to the next, right? I, I wanted to be an actor. So I was just like, ah, oh, all the attention, oh, ah, ah, right? And just, it was like the id from Freud, just like, just like chasing the next high, whatever would make me feel good, right? And it was imbalanced, you know what I mean? I was reactive to life forever. And when you have kids and you're reactive to life and you don't know who you are, then you end up making that their problem. 
right? And so all of this, it was drama, drama, drama. And, you know, like, and the thing is, you never, uh, you know this, you never believe that it's you. Mm -hmm. When you're in victim mindset or victim consciousness, it's never you. It's always God. <laughs> you know, it's always God. It's always life. It's always this Adam's complaint. Cause he was a bitch. This woman that you gave me, you know, <laughs> yeah, not no. the apple thing, but she, she, she ate it. She did it. Was, it, was, it, was, it was. <laughs> I, I trusted her. She gave me the apple. Like, come on. Like she looked okay. Nothing happened to her. <laughs> Women invented betrayal. That's why. Right? And so, <laughs> you came so <from> me. <laughs> <laughs> what does that say about you, asshole? <laughs> <laughs> so you know that was a that was a big thing i was irresponsible i guess that's if i were to if i were to boil it all down to a single word i was irresponsible for all of my life it was just like mommy would take care of me daddy would take care of me my sister would take care of me this next girlfriend would take care of me this next job right blah 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 my security and sense of self came from outside of me and it got so bad that i you know Here's here's what happened actually. I I fell in love with coaching. Someone believed in me enough to invest 4K for me to get you know certified by John Maxwell because they saw I was struggling, but I had gifts and I had they you know I'm only here because a handful of people saw something in me that I didn't see. It was always there, but there's always going to be someone who sees something right, who sees the worth in everybody. And, and she's like a second mom to me. Her name is Terry Brady. And she's like, you have something. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. And so, boom, 4K. And I go to get certified by John Maxwell. I come back, I get my first client. Oh my God, right? 2K hits my Venmo. I call my first coach. I'm not crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> I'm not crazy. I'm delivering pizza while doing coaching calls. It was the best. <laughs> right? right? Well, if you could talk to, you know, little, you know, five-year-old, here's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, what would you say to him? You know? And like, so I was trying to build up this business and I, I was under the, the phase of the spiritual red pill douchebag. Yeah. Right. Been there. So, yeah. I went through all of the, 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 I actually like his stuff, but like the Casey Owens Anders, right? I went through like, you know, Owen Cook and, and here's how to get girls and bypass this, that, and the third and find, you know, outsource more of your self worth onto the hotter women and more materialistic <laughs> things, more Dan Bilzerian lifestyle, right? In, in fucking Lompoc, California, which is the, the literal armpit of California, right? And so all this stuff happened. And, uh, um, so I'm trying to build up this business and I, and I keep repeating the same patterns. I keep getting into the same fights with this woman. I keep getting, I, my kids don't listen to me. Right. Like I always, I can never exceed this amount of money or these amount of clients, nothing. And so what do you do when you're still in victim consciousness? You still blame. So I blame this family for now holding me back from my own potential. Mm. Right. Now I'm like, you guys are keeping me from being Tony Robbins, <laughs> right? Because it's yeah. always them for me. Then finally what happens is um, my beautiful woman, she relapses. She was a heroin addict before we had met. But then she gets so stressed out because she and her people pleasing, she's trying to keep, to keep the kids together. She's actually paying all of the bills. Wow. She would f fight with her. And she's like, so are you... Are you considering getting a job, you know, like at some point, right? I know that you're building your dream and I know that it's important, you know, but I'm a woman and I would love to have a man here, right? Mm. Bitch, fucking Jesus, destroy my dream, so fucked up, fucked up, right? And so my pain consumed the household. My lack of balls, my lack of being grounded to the earth, right? I was not operating from my masculine core. I was operating from my wounds and from my head. And my ego was it. 
And so she ends up like convincing me. She ends up legit convincing me, look, I am burnt out in order to continue to watch these kids so you can build your stupid coaching practice and you can make your stupid dreams come true. I need something. So she convinced my very ignorant, very naive ass that heroin could do it. I was so stupid. I legitimately thought it was a source of energy. I was like, oh, wow, two weeks. We get two weeks where she's like super mom. She's watching the kids, right? The house is super clean. It was amazing, right? I was like, oh, maybe there's... <laughs> this is embarrassing as shit, but I want to give you the real and the raw. Yeah, man. So, I feel it. I was so fucking stupid. I legitimately thought that it was working. Okay? And... Two weeks go by, and then she's just like passed out all day. Now I'm watching the kids, and I'm trying to like, well, no, I never knew my father, right? Like, I'm trying to do this. I'm watching the kids. I'm cleaning up, and I'm getting resentful. And what happens when you have that? There's only one thing that can happen here: is it culminates to a peak, and something's gonna give. Someone's gonna blow, and they do. The thing that happens is our family implodes. There was, um, we can get like, there's no holds barred, right? It's just, Dude, you go, just be you. Right. <laughs> so she would actually convince me to take her to Skid Row in Los Angeles in the middle of the night when she runs out. And I, we can't leave the kids because they're all under like seven years old, right? Eight years old. So I take them while they're sleeping and I take them over to Skid Row so that she can score some freaking smack. And I indulge it because I'm like, it gets her off my back. And I was just continuing to perpetuate this sick dynamic. And it was scary. It was just, it was hard, man. <laughs> like, like it was, so, it was the worst time of my entire life. And my kids... They're like, why is mom always in the bathroom? Why is mom always asleep, right? Why are you always yelling at us, <laughs> you know? Like, everyone. And so mom and dad don't have it together. And the kids, like, they were missing school left and right. And they're just con having panic attacks and all this stuff. We traumatized them. We traumatized our kids, right? And um, my oldest son, his bio dad, found out about this because I actually called him for help because he was a recovering addict. And I was like, hey, my dumbass didn't realize that he wanted his son back, right? So then I call him, hey, by the way, you know, the mom is, you know, on heroin. I don't know what to do. Oh, we'll send him over here, right? We'll help you get her to rehab and get her clean, you know? So we send my oldest boy over, right, to Florida, and they don't give him back. Wow, bro. So then we go into the whole courtroom <laughs> drama, right? We file a thing. We do a thing. We fly all of these things. Then we get him back for two weeks and they call CPS. They call CPS and she's not clean, right? We were just like uh, 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 empowered by the self-righteousness, right? And the, the, the injustice. How dare they? How dare they? you know, try and protect this little boy from us because we're the heroes of our own story, right? Never mind, we're the fucking villains, but we're the heroes yeah. of our own story. So it's family versus family. There's so much family drama. Everybody's involved. Her estranged mother's involved, the grandparents, my parents, all of these people. And they're seeing this family just get torn to shreds from the inside out. And so we have the oldest one for about two weeks. They call CPS, and then finally there's a warrant out. There's a warrant out for arrest, right? We get the phone call. Hey, this is officer such and such. We have a, we have a, we're here with this, you know, CPS officer. We have a warrant out for your arrest, right? And, or sorry, not a warrant out for our arrest. We have a warrant out for the kids. Right. We had lost, officially lost custody of the kids, right? Not our arrest. It's not there yet. But, um, so we get the phone call. We're driving, okay? We're on our way to Whole Foods or some shit. I get the call and we're like, we're not home right now. Okay, well, we're going to be here. Don't do anything stupid. It's you. very on brand for us. Anything, do anything stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know 
how we got here, motherfucker? <laughs> Doing stupid shit. And so, you know, that would be out of character to not do so, essentially. <laughs> right. And so, like, uh, um, God, man, it's crazy really telling the story. <laughs> Usually when I tell the whole thing, so the other person is like, they look yeah, like a easy. Muppet. This is this is all the human condition to me, bro. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, this is this is the this is the meat and potatoes of yeah. what it means to be human. And I it's think real. It's, it's real. It's, it's, that's why, and, and I'm gonna get to this. This is why I have so much compassion for every human being yeah. on Earth now. But like, so basically, I I have a panic attack. We're at a 7-Eleven. I'm sitting on the floor and I'm looking at this woman, and now she's in full uh, um um. Not sur- not just survival mode, but like damage control, right? She's like, okay, I've made all these mistakes. It's all my fault. This is all, we're going to fix this. It's all okay, right? What we need to do, we need to wait for them to leave. We need to pack up all of our shit and we need to leave California. Okay. Okay. And here's the thing. She sold me because she, because she comes from foster care. Right. She comes from foster care. She comes from abuse. And foster care is like freaking Holocaust for a teenager. Mm. You know, it's Auschwitz. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe there are some good ones, but for, for all intents and purposes, my God. Right. It's this assembly line. And it's almost like as soon as you age out, you end up on Skid Row like immediately. Wow. You know? Man. Wow. And so she um she comes from there and she's like, these kids are not going to survive. I want you to picture this. You have a two-year-old daughter, okay? And she's in foster care. These kids will die. They're, they're being screwed up by us, but they will die if they go to foster care. We cannot let that happen. So my brain, the, what's left of the good father instinct in me, right, is like, okay, well, I don't want my kids to die, <laughs> right? So that's what we do. We literally hide out, Right. I'm crying my eyes out at a park somewhere over in Long Beach. We wait. And then, um, oh, yeah, that's right. I had one client. So I still took a coaching call. (laughs) Dedication. I had had one coaching call that day. (laughs) Jesus Christ. And so I won that day. And then we waited till the end of the night. And then we, we broke into our own apartment. We stayed up all night throwing away 99% of our stuff, right? throwing away everything and i'm just like in this trauma phase fog of just throwing everything into the garbage and just looking at all the things that i bought our life and we stuffed our 2016 honda accord to the gills with just clothes and just like a couple books and, and we take off we we go to the methadone clinic so she can get like one you take home, right? And then we take off at like five o'clock and we head out for just the middle of the country where she has a best friend in the middle of nowhere in the boonies in like Illinois. Okay. We t- we go there and that was an odyssey in and of itself, but we go there for all of winter of 2020. All right, the winter of 2020, we're hiding out. My parents are calling, they're all freaking out. My entire world has exploded. Everyone is freaking the fuck out. Where's Richard? Where's his woman? Where are these kids? Right? Never and and now now we have a warrant out. Now there's a warrant out. So, and this this is the Hollywood esque <laughs> component to it. We have a lot of really really rough weeks at a Motel Six. Okay, we're just like just hiding eating food, watching a lot of TV and just living that fugitive lifestyle. Like just <laughs> that's all, that's it, man. We were just Harrison Ford. It was, and Tommy wow. Lee Jones, CPS from California looking for our asses, right? Looking for that one armed man. <laughs> and, and we, you know, we had hit this breaking point where it, it was, it was, we're either going to kill ourselves, right? We're going to kill these kids or we're, we're, we're going to change. Something has to happen. And we have a come to Jesus moment. The Biden money hits during the pandemic. The Biden money hits. We have enough for a down payment on an apartment. Someone is like, I'll take it. I'll take cash. You can get it today. 
right? I don't take credit because it was in freaking South Side Chicago. It was like no one's there. It's a barren wasteland. <laughs> so there was like this one apartment out in the middle of nowhere. And um, he's like, all right, come on in. And, and we're like, we pack up all of our stuff. We're, we have this intention of renewal, right? Like spring energy. It's okay. All right. And we completely forgot about California. <laughs> we blocked it out. She's like, all right, I'm going to go to the methadone clinic. I'm going to clean up. I'm going to get sober. I'm going to get anger management. I'm going to get therapy. I'm going to get therapy. We're all going to get therapy. We're all going to, you know, rebuild our family from the ground up. And then we, we pass one cop right next to the apartment and they turn around and they just stop us because we had a, a broken taillight. The cliche as it gets, but we had a broken taillight. They run my ID. They take her out of the car. Boom right slam her against the hood okay then they then i have to i look at the kids tell them everything's going to be okay and they take me and we get arrested and i can look i can see the place that would have been our home that was the worst night that was the worst day of my life that was when when we had gotten arrested and some asshole drove away with my kids and my car <laughs> And we didn't see them for months. Wow, man. Dude, we I was in a because it was kidnapping, we were we were arrested for kidnapping, right? And they didn't know who I was. They didn't, they had to verify that I was their father. So I was just a kidnapper in their eyes. So we got the kidnapper treatment, right? Like wow. I was legit hook in the wall of the holding cell in Chicago. They chained me to that bitch. And I'm like in this weird, uncomfortable position. Right. And Olivia's in the holding cell across the way from me. And she's screaming she, like she's reliving her nightmare. Like this is her biggest fear. And so she's withdrawing and she lost her kids and she's freaking out. Right. So she's not having a good time. <laughs> I'm freaking the fuck out. Mm. The only thing that I think to do is use what tools I had developed as a coach. Right. Just sit and meditate. Like literally, that's all I could. Uh, I was meditating like this, mind you. <laughs> I was just like sitting and meditating, and just like, what would Wayne Dyer do? Well, he probably wouldn't <laughs> fucking. He probably wouldn't be in this fucking position. Maybe he might drink and just get mad at somebody. But goddamn it, right? He'd visualize a beach. <laughs> Visualizing some mimosas. <laughs> It is what it is. And so, you know, the, the caseworker came in. We've taken the children away. You know, they're, they're, we don't care about you guys. Like, like we're going to let you go after this, you know, but we, we have the kids. You want to get them? Go to California and fight for them. I don't know what else to tell you, you know, but they're gone. They don't belong to you anymore. You failed. And so they let Liv and I go. We got back into our car and we just like magnetized. Right. We just we just magnetized to one another and we just screamed this guttural primal fucking, you know, Native American, just like Rah! all right, just just at the top of our lungs, man. We just lost it. And it was in that moment that something clicked. That that's when it clicked. That they we have to get them back. How are we gonna get them back? You. Mm. You were not man enough to avoid this, right? You were not responsible enough. You, the things that you have touched have burnt to the ground. Because this, this, this whole, all of this shit, right? It's a mess. And the, the irony of ironies is that I, like, intellectually had consumed you know like the personal development hamster wheel you start oh, reading yeah. david hawk you start reading wayne you start go, think and grow rich and all of a sudden you're like everybody should be an entrepreneur right yeah. like you're trying to convince the mailman to go after his dreams i'm like i'm good bro i got this far one guy <laughs> retiring next. no you need to fuck it, right don't let your dreams be dreams just do it <laughs> everyone's a life coach like you're trying to inspire everybody to everything you re we all read the same fucking things it's the untethered soul right like, like it's our intention 15 laws of growth blah, 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 blah. i knew those things coming into this 
I knew those fucking things coming into this intellectually, but the embodiment wasn't there. Mm. And so now it's time to embody it. So when we get back to California, we're homeless. We don't have an apartment. I can't stay with my parents because they, by the grace of God, I'm always going to be grateful to my parents for this. They did whatever they needed to do. They moved mountains to become the foster parents of my kids. Wow. Right? And then uh, bio dad of my oldest, he ends up taking the oldest, uh, the, my oldest Harry back to Texas. Right? And he was the villain in my life story as a father for like two years until I realized, honestly, he was doing like what he believed was best, which was protect mm-hmm. my fucking son from these psychopaths, yeah. you know? And it's easy to see now, right? Like when, when you actually do the work, you take responsibility for this stuff, you empathize. You're able to empathize with the police that arrested you. You're able to empathize with your heroin addicted wife. You're able to empathize with child protective services. Yeah. You know, and that's really the shift. But we took two years being homeless in this car, like so much had happened, man. We were, we were living in Skid Row while she was trying to get sober. She'd been on methadone now. Thank God she's sober two years. Like she just did it. Like as soon as she lost the kids, that's her click. Okay. Fine, God, you win. No more heroin for for Olivia. Yeah. She cleans the fuck up. And then I have to just run in the direction of sovereignty. And I found my refuge, my solace in masculinity, masculine leadership, in in consciousness, in realizing what it truly means to be a protector and and a provider, right? And there's you're part of a sacred brotherhood when you actually embody that, when you make that decision. It's not the Andrew Tate, right? It's not yeah. like I have to win at the expense of you. It's I have to win and I'm going to pull you up with me. And then I'm going to live in this place of integrity. And I'm going to surround myself with guys to be like, hey, you're getting fat, <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, you're fucking up. Hey, you're being a dick to your woman. Hey, you're better than that, right? To be a man who dedicates himself to unconditional love. Yeah. Because that's what you want. Right? That's where that's where Wayne comes in. He says, well, you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice. You squeeze a heart-centered, conscious man, what comes out? Love. Power. The ability to affect change and protect people who need protecting. And to provide for them to do hard things like build a coaching practice, rebuild this thing out of the trunk of your car. Yeah. And have hard conversations and even get on podcasts and face this story. Right? To be able to say this without getting re-triggered or re-traumatized on my end. It took a long time. And I wear this story like a badge of honor. Not to overly identify with it, right? But yeah. This is a tool now. It is one of the greatest tools in my toolkit for ha- to have compassion for every man who's like, get my woman. You know what I mean? To have compassion for the man who's like, I'm addicted to porn. I am addicted to alcohol. I'm so angry at these kids, right? I just hate my life. And if I can, I can hold that space and just... I see you, motherfucker, because I I be you, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. You recognize yourself in everyone. So who the fuck am I to judge you? Mm. That's my story. That's my- <laughs> bro, that was that was beautiful. I was that was and yeah, like reflecting that back, bro, like the way you tell that story, it's so embodied. Um, mm, and you, you, you really, you really hear the, 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 the realness in the emotion and yeah, mm. and also the, the lesson, the lesson comes through in your voice, not that I need to relive this again, but like the lesson, this is what I got. Mm. This is what I, this is what, this is what happened. This is what I needed to do. This is the reality of the situation. And yeah, bro, that, that, those stories, I'm going to goosebumps. Yeah, those stories are the game changers. Because yeah. it, it really speaks to the the heart of the matter for especially for guys who can get swept up in that drama by their partner, right? Oh, this is a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Wait, what the fuck am I doing? This is that's not the good <laughs> idea. Right. <laughs> I don't know what to do. You make the decision. 
Wait, what? It, what? <laughs> and don't being, fear. Yeah, and being able to ground yourself in. I mean, like women totally got epic. Like I don't know for my partner, like Cassie, amazing intuition. And mm-hmm. then I need to screen it because there's times when okay, you, you're stressed. This isn't. That's not. That's not. That's not yeah. your intuition. That's your. That's your. I don't want to feel this feeling. I don't want to feel this hurt. I don't want to feel this pain. I don't want to do the hard thing. Yeah. Um, and being able to stand in that and risk the relationship. I, I know for me, like being that recovering nice guy, like being able to risk the relationship to say, fucking no, not, not yeah. that. That's not, that's not the game plan. We're not doing that. Um, this, is, this is where we need to go. And speaking with an authority and respect, not making her like wrong per se, but speaking yeah. with authority and respect and, Oh, yeah, this is what we need to do. Yeah, man, that story, dude. I want to listen to that again. Can you, t- can you tell it again? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we don't have that kind of time, Richard. My God. So I dude, thought she was a girl. Why are you now? But um. <laughs> so like, no, so you know, you go. I was just gonna say to your point. Um, you know, when I look, when I reflect back, one of the things I didn't advocate for my children. And that's who needed a big, strong man in the house, too. So did, so did Olivia, honestly, right? But that was the hardest lesson I could ever have learned, is that a man has to learn to do what is right, even if he loses love as a result yeah. of it. Fuck yeah, bro. Yeah. That's, that's the and, natural, dude. Yeah. Dude, I was not willing. I was not willing to lose Liv because... I was like, will I ever get into a, the, the nice guy fears, the limiting beliefs of the traditional nice guy. I'll never find anyone hotter, right? I'll lose love forever. I'll be stuck with this, blah, 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 blah. But it's not just your outer children that need to be advocated for. It's your inner child, yeah. you know, needs to be advocated for. And at that point, Olivia was making decisions that were compromising the safety and integrity of her own inner child. And so when a man truly embodies his masculine core, he advocates for the kids on the outside and the kids on the inside. Yeah. Amen, bro. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, with your story and your, and your relationship past, like what, what are the kind of men that you end up attracting like in your work or encouraged to come into work with you? Mm. At the risk of sounding cliche, oh, I mean, th- that story was still a cliche because it's not, you know, there's a lot of guys who've been through it. They've done it. But uh, life doesn't give you what you want. Life gives you what you are, right? Correct. And guys that, the guys that end up finding me are the guys that feel the way that I felt when I was, you know, at my lowest. And they're, they may not be hiding in a Motel 6 from Child Protective Services. They're hiding from their family. Mm. hiding from their self right and i actually just i recently enrolled someone who said i never feel man enough for anybody right and and as a result you try to overcompensate that's why so many of these high-performing men are so good at business right you know this you work with them too like it's i'm going to try and prove myself i'm going to use this chip on my shoulder to make millions of dollars and crush it, but I still don't know who I am, but I think that that's going to fill the hole in my soul. Yeah. And then that's what will finally get this bitch to respect me. <laughs> yeah, totally. Why don't you respect me yet? It must be you. Yeah. It's you. You're the one. There's plenty of other bitches out there. I just find, I just find one that respects me. Andrew Tate. Right. One. And it's, you can't buy it. You can't you buy, buy it. it. Yeah. It's it back, you know? And so I tend to, I very often tend to find either recovering nice guys or guys that are still in those phases that have not learned to discover their own sovereignty. They haven't learned how to say no, right, to their wife. They haven't learned how to set that boundary and, and be like, okay, I'm not in control of you, right? But if you want a big, strong man to be in charge, then I'm going to play that role. Of being in charge. That's where masculine leadership comes in, right? The ability to respond rather than to react to your woman, which ironically ends up making her feel safer than anything. Yeah. The ability to not just be as emotional, number one, right? 
But number two, to, to not move and not speak, not do anything until you choose to. Yeah. Right? What did Viktor Frankl say? Choice is the last of the human freedoms. You burn everything away from a man, which he literally had that happen to him. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. Well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to put myself on that same pedestal. I'm just going to say I can relate. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hashtag can relate. Right? And, <laughs> and so... I'm there, I'm, I'm there with you, Franco. I'm there with you, bro. Bro, Franco, respect. <laughs> but that's it, dude, right? It's like, it's, it's at the end of the day, you have. You're breaking up a bit there, bro. <clears throat> I think, um, I think, I think it, it's either me breaking up or you breaking up. A choice. And when men make. Did, did your phone overheat or. Did did Victor did Victor Frank uh, yeah, yeah. Frankl be on the grave? <laughs> so Victor Frankl's spirit is like, bitch. <laughs> I'm the captain now, and so so I decided to turn the car on and turn the AC off. <laughs> oh. And I, but no, man, that's it. It's like the ability to choose from this centered, grounded, instinctual place to protect your woman right from your own temper your own temperament you know what i mean from yeah. ego disconnection right that's one of the we frames that i like teach these guys it's always you and me versus disconnection always when you have a when you have a clearly defined fourth star such as love right such as unconditional love and connection and, and growth if you put growth at the nucleus of your relationship what happens every single argument becomes a catalyst for deeper connection yeah but someone has to be in charge during those times. Why not the one who enjoys being strong, being the rock, who has a natural proclivity towards being, you know, uh, the, the lighthouse amidst the storm? Mm. Let her rant and rave and rail and, and, and be the divine feminine, which is sometimes a lot. Yeah. But that's where her joy is. Authentic self-expression of the feminine, right? It is uncontrollable. It's untamable. And you have the masculine, which is, okay, forward movement, right? Steady, consistent. They're complementing each other. So wonderful. Because one of the things that I've learned is that when trust is established, the feminine will choose, Right? It'll choose to submit. Okay, this guy's got the balls to fucking tell me no, right? He has the balls to know, to love me in spite of being a hot mess. Yeah. Right? And that is real power, in my opinion. Yeah. To emulate what I believe, like mm. how, how Christ really showed up as a man, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll do that. It was that was some that was some like Mount Mount Olive shit you're speaking to there. That was um that, that was beautiful. Uh, what I heard in that too was um, like transitioning from this man who's running from fear into like no, I love being this rock. I love being this direct person, right? Because especially in on my journey, it was the Okay, I need to avoid avoid the thing, avoid the fear, avoid the hurt. But now I'm like, now nah, let's go into this head first, and because I, I yeah. know what's on the other side of it. Um, but how do you inspire men to to transition from that running from fear into like, now nah, let's let's face this thing? Well, that's a wonderful question. You know, it's interesting. It's not so much what I. It's not so much about doing, you know, like the greatest mentors I've ever had. They could just look at you, <laughs> you know, they could just look at you from this place of deep knowing and deep love. And, and they're like, whatever is on the other side of the screen, it's not going to affect me. I'm not going to make it mean shit about me. Right. Like I'm just safe. I, I am safety. And what I found is that when a man embodies that desire 
to be safe, to harness, because I, I say it all the time, masculinity is like a fire. Yeah. It can burn your house down or it can keep the family warm and cook a steak. Right. But it's in the wielder. Mm. Man who can be furious and still loving. Yeah. To hold those two powers and to still choose love. Tell me what's more powerful. Right. And so the guys who, the mentors I've had who have changed my life, they, all they did was reflect back. They created a space and, and you know exactly what that's like because you do it too. It's not, you don't do anything. You simply be, right? You be the safe space. You be the space holder and you be the empty cup and they fill it with everything. But the thing that fills that cup that changes their life is the truth. Mm. I'm just going to be the fucking cup which is this moment, which is the space held between two men who have dedicated themselves. Coaching, I love the description of it, is it is a designed alliance between the participant and the facilitator to take a person of value from where they are to where they want to go. It's a designed alliance, you and me together. And what does it say in the Bible, right? If, if, if two or more are gathered in my name, that is fellowship. Yeah. That is divine. And so when you just be there for me, I'm going to feel seen. I'm going to feel safe. I'm probably going to crack, right? Because we make grown ass men cry for a living. That's it. Like at the end of the day. Absolutely. And then they make a bunch of money and have a bunch of sex. Like, (laughs) (laughs) that's it. Like, if I, if I'm not making if I'm not making someone cry every day, I don't feel like I'm doing my job. <laughs> with your son, with, with Luca. It's like, hey, let's turn let's turn these 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 thumb screws up a little bit more. Yeah, what's what are you, what are you really feeling? So, what is your grow your crying grown ass man story? I'll appreciate this as a as a as a coach. Is that I you know. I signed the biggest deal of my entire life with the, the absolute pinnacle that like this dude was made in a vacuum, right? Like just the perfect client, you know, corporate, like, like million or 2 million in business per year, right? Whatever, like, like high performing to do dude, dude. And he had said some, like he was just speaking. And one part of the nice guy tendencies is like, you'll fill the space with talk. Yeah. Right. Not very consciously chosen words at times. And he had said something about, you know, and and in the context, I don't want to give anything away, right? But in the context, essentially, he was compromising his own safety and security and his own integrity. And he said it out loud like it was nothing. I said, whoa! Pause. Flag on the play. What? And he's like, yeah, no. Insert thing. I was like, okay. We're not going to breeze. We can't breeze through that. Yeah. We cannot breeze through that. And it's so beautiful. Like He's like, okay. And and I have the rapport there. I have the trust built, right? So we're doing this. And I was like, I need you to look at me. And I need you to just say that exact thing. Just look at me and say that. Okay. Then he says it. And I'm like, all right, don't do anything else. And it lands for the first time. And it connects with all of the different times where he compromised the safety of the inner little boy, that five-year-old inside. And he just cracks. And everything in me is like, say something to console him, say something to do something, come on, just make him feel better, tell him it's not his fault. Goodwill hunting this motherfucker, right? <laughs> You know, just, just Robin Williams him. God damn it, do something. But, but you know, like God whispers, you know, the yeah. mind will shout, 
these folks shout God whispers and, and the voice of God without paraphrasing because I'm cursing, but he's like, shut the fuck up. Don't fuck up. Nope. Nope. You stay silent. You give this to him. You give him the gift of experiencing this pain. And I see it from top soup to nuts, top to bottom, everything experiences this self-betrayal and it hurts. And I feel like, like I, I told, I told a buddy of mine, I was like, I feel like a rapper that had just made it right. Had just been signed. You know, it just sold out the garden. You yeah, know what I mean? nice. And Dre's and, come and like cupped your nuts and said, yeah, you, you, you've got this. Right. Like, he's about to play best I ever had, you know, like, like, he's, <laughs> like, my my hit song is about to come on. That was it, man. That felt like a. It was the culmination of everything I've ever experienced, everything I've ever learned, and everything I've ever done to be there. Because I thought you needed a master NLP, you need a master hypnotherapy, you need a master, you know, sh- 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 akashic records. You got to be able to do past life regressions. You got to like know all of their chakras and be able to the old all of it. Yeah, you need to do it all, and I'm like, or, or, you can have him say this and have him experience himself, and just hold that space. Yeah, and be the best, most unconditionally loving force in his life. And and from there, he reconnected. And I said, and I that that I did say to him, I was like, even after all that, that little boy still loves you. Now it's your job to advocate for him. That's where transformation happens. That's the grown ass crying man story. Bro, I love that. I love that. And and yeah, like you like that the corporate guy, millions, and he's never had someone hold him to task to his emotions, right? No one's actually heard that one sentence or those handful of words and go, hey, stop. We're not just gonna glance over that. Like, and then hold him, dude, look at me. Say it again. Uh, what, like, to put a price tag on that, like, because yeah, with all that, all those credentials that you just threw up, like an MBA, an MBA, and you had to put a, a butt plug in or whatever it is, Akashic record, like chakra, like I can, I can do, I can do, I've done singing bowls from, I've got forty <laughs> singing bowls or whatever it is, like yeah. But what's your presence worth? Can you put a price tag on your presence, right? And that embodiment of the human condition to be able to hear, like five words in a whole ramble of a story and go, Hey, wait, that's the thing that you're avoiding and be with it, bro. Like that, that's, that's, that's God's work. Mm -hmm. Like to be able to hear that and be able to go brother or sister, whoever you're working with brother, be that. And the price tag piece. So it's been interesting for my journey with price tags like when I first yeah. started this, like I got some really high ticket, that high ticket nectar, right? And now it's like, okay, now I need to be of service to community and be able to be smarter with my deals and 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 do it slightly differently. What's the what's the underflow of the currency that's here in where I'm communicating with people and trusting my intuition to go, okay, cool. I need to work with this person. I keep getting this yes. They don't have the kind of money that that I'd normally expect someone who has their own business or done like ex corporate or whatever it is. And I need to work with them. And there's this, there's this voice in me that argues, nah, John, you know, you need to get, you need to make sure they pay that, like whatever it is, like 20 grand, 30 grand, or whatever it is. And yeah. they're not, they're like, they can't afford it. So fuck them, you know? And I wait a minute, this is this is beyond my timeline right now. This is like like planting trees, knowing that I'm never gonna sit under the shade of this tree. But this is like the future generations of like their kids and their kids' kids. And there's something that's that's a ripple effect of and in, in that coaching space, like that next tier of coaching space where it's now this is this is like a, a biblical. This is like something that's much bigger. Um yeah. yeah, I spoke a lot there. What do you what are you hearing that? Can I share uh my a perspective on that? Trust it. Just gimme. Yeah. Um we go into business for ourselves, right? Like the, the the entrepreneur's journey is to honor what's inside of you and bring it out, right? So it always has to be on your terms. The idea that it has to, that that business or how your own operating, right? How you operate 
like that it has to meet the standard of the market or the standard of high ticket coaches or whatever it is, right? That's external affecting the internal, right? Now to that, I would say like my 15, you have Telegram, right? You have like an unlimited access to me. Obviously I got to take a shit and be with my kids within boundaries, but you have that, right? We have weekly calls, right? And then we have like, I'll answer if I want to after 8 p.m. Yep. You know? So that, that in of itself for me, like, I like that. I feel that feels good. That feels congruent, right? But if you're in my, if you're in my 2K container, cool. I will see you on the coaching call, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. I'll see you on the group call. But that, for me, it's an opportunity. It's an invitation to be more intentional and more, you know, aligned. You got to learn to listen to yourself. And so from what I'm hearing on that is that, yeah, if it's a yes for you, you make it work because there's nothing outside that should ever determine the decisions that you make in your business. Now, if you're, you're like, you know, you let this person in for 1K and then there's someone else that is paying you 20 and you're giving them the exact same amount of you, right? There might be some incongruency there, right? There might be some compromising of integrity. But if we're doing, okay, look, there's three calls for one month. They're going to change your life because one hour with you will change their freaking life, right? Yeah. Three calls, 1K, we work together for a month and we'll do like two follow-ups or whatever, like a Q&A, right? That's 1K. You have given them an incredible experience, changed their life, and then what do they end up doing? They end up being able, resourced by God and themselves to go pay more, right? Because they're like investments. Hey, I'm going to just love on you. I feel called to make it work somehow. Yeah. That's the intuitive hit. We never, like, God is always talking to you. When are you going to answer the phone? Right? And betrayal of the self is the highest form of betrayal. So if you feel the yes, you know, if, if it's a hell yes for you, and then you say no because of external bullshit, that's limiting belief, right? That's people pleasing. Mm. What'll my business coach say? Fuck them. You, know I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, I hired you to help me get to this level. I've gotten to this level, right? And I'm going cont- to play this game on my terms. It's your fucking game to play. Yeah. That's just, those are my thoughts. That's a, just a perspective on that. You that's know, because I, that's, I yeah. I feel the same. I feel the same way, honestly. And now I'm enjoying this high ticket. Like, you know, <laughs> like it makes for a me, big difference, I'm bro. Back, I'm not going back anytime fucking soon. <laughs> but I will say, I will say that when I shoot content for TikTok, when I do something, I'm shooting it with the intention of helping you save your fucking marriage. Yeah. Right. I'm, I want you to do that without me. That's my version of abundance. It's my content is designed to be an online course for the masses, right? Yeah. And if you're like, I love this guy, right? What would it be like to have him in my back pocket, in my corner, you know, on some Creed fucking Adonis and Rocky shit? <laughs> Vin Diesel coming at you. You know? Yeah. Family, right? Like, <laughs> but, that was one of the, I wrote a sketch one time where I was Vin Diesel, but I have my voice, this tenory, you know, hey guys, oh boy, oh no shit, oh, fuck it up. No. Uh, yeah, those are, I mean, those are just my thoughts on it, man. It's just like, it's, it is your game. That's something one of my, one of my favorite mentors always says, and he's like, pisses me off more than anybody else on the planet. Cause he just like, doesn't care. And it's all about truth and just honoring you. Right. And he always reflects it back. I'm like, well, what should I do? Right. It's your game to play. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Richard, it's been a delight. Absolute freaking delight. I feel complete, bro. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, you can find me at 312530. I don't fucking care. No, I'm just <laughs> No, please. Dude, how can not... people find you? How can they find you? Because you, you've, you've, you've spoken to some frequencies that I reckon a lot of, lot of people are going to want to like either refer friends to you or they're going to want to work yeah. with you directly. So how can people get in your pocket? 
Dude, I just Facebook, man. Just Richard Earl Lonsberry, E A R L, right? Just E-A-R-L. Richard Earl Lonsberry, Facebook. Yeah. If if you can stomach the content that I have, <laughs> and if it triggers you enough to be like, okay, fuck this guy, we're probably meant to work together. <laughs> hey, I'm a Vin Diesel too. Hey, we're buddies. Great. Let's do family. This. Family. You're my family. <laughs> nice <laughs> Richard bro it's been uh, it's been an honor it's been an honor to, to listen to you and yeah. to witness your wisdom and your your story and um, and connect with you as a, as a man as a father um, as another human on this planet on this journey to serve um, and bring that bring that heaven mm. Yeah. Mm. mad yeah, love bro oh, thank you Thanks for having me.